knew that, <laughs> to this meeting of the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee on the 24th of October 2024. Just to remind members that this meeting is being recorded and will be available to view on YouTube. Apologies is the next item. I've had apologies from Councillor Natalie Statham. Are there any others? No others? Moving on, thank you very much. The minutes of the previous meeting held on the 17th of September are here for approval. Has everybody read them? Is everybody prepared to move them? Thank you, Councillor Hadley. Second? Thank you, Councillor Doyle. All those in favour, please show. Any against? You're looking at me. Yes, you are. You could just be nice, though. <laughs> Declarations of interest. Are there any interests to be declared on any items on this agenda? None at all. Thank you very much. Moving swiftly. Go on, then. I, I don't know if, I, if it's at all relevant, but I'll declare it anyway. Uh, having read the... Uh, papers before and particularly item eight um, I, I notice there's reference to uh, the great work that Samaritans undertake etc and just so everybody's aware I am a member of this I'm a listening volunteer at the Samaritans although I don't think it has any bearing on that item at all but I just thought I'd make that open thank you thank you I don't think there's any direct conflict of interest but thank you for the declaration um, update from the chair I don't have any updates at this stage. Um, responses to reports of the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee. Um, just to advise the committee that I did go to Cabinet on the 10th of October to present the recommendations made by the committee at our meeting on the 17th of September in relation to the Armed Forces Covenant. Cabinet have agreed to the appointment of a non-political role of Armed Forces Champion whilst there are serving members who are indeed veterans. So they did agree to that recommendation from this committee. Is that all right? Is everybody okay with that? Thank you. You don't need any vote on that, do you? No. <laughs> uh, considerations of matters referred to the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee from Cabinet or Council. There are none. Um, item 7 is a, uh, an update on health-related matters considered by Staffordshire County Council. I have received no digest of matters that have arisen and unfortunately Councillor Jones is not here to present his report. I just want to remind the committee that you can access the details of the Staffordshire Healthcare and Overview and Scrutiny Committee online. The minutes are available for the most recent meeting on the 23rd of September and the agenda for the next meeting on the 28th of October, which is Monday, uh, is available and I will be going to that meeting. Any questions on that? Um, moving on then to the substantive item which is safeguarding children and adults at risk. Um, I'm so pleased you turned up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's to provide the biannual safeguarding update to this committee and to highlight that I need to highlight that the report um, has the incorrect portfolio holder showing. It should, I understand, be Councillor Lewis Smith who is the portfolio holder for this. And he has sent his apologies, yes. So can I uh, welcome you? Thank you. <laughs> oh, is it not working? Thank you. Um, a lot of you are aware, obviously, of the reports that we put forward for health and wellbeing scrutiny. So it's just a general overview of what we've been doing um, in the council since the last report um, took place in March. So as you can see, referrals have gone up, children and adults referrals. Adults is always um, very much more a higher threshold because of how we deal with our housing stock so because we have our own housing stock a lot of referrals do come from our housing operatives our support teams our tenancy sustainment officers um, we do have some referrals that have come from um, our contractors as well which has been a positive step forward and i think that's just a highlight of the fact that training is vital because it does bring 
to everyone's forefront the responsibilities of every member of staff that if they see something they have to say something they have to report it and they have to use the appropriate form to do so um, obviously the time of report um, was written we're coming into the third quarter so the figures for October are still um, being processed as of yesterday I received five safeguard referrals alone so it is very very busy at the moment majority of things that we tend to see is around mental health concerns and issues we have got very good partnerships with our mental health colleagues and um, they play a vital role in the Tamworth and mobility partnership meetings they're a very good support network great for signposting and offering services of support um, so the figures have been put in a small table but we've reflected the figures in the actual um, appendices so you've got a full overall flavour of what's been going on in regards to our figures over from um, back in 2018-19 all the way up to the current point of where we are today in regards to those as well. Um, safeguarding training continues, so we do offer safeguarding training annually to all our staff. We have links with the Staffordshire Safeguarding Children's Board Partnership. They're no longer known as Staffordshire Safeguarding Children's Board. They want to be known as a partnership now. They do exactly the same as what they've always done. It's just the fact they've taken the alignment to be known as a partnership rather than a board. So we um, acquire the slides annually. We update that information and that information is then updated, obviously, to our staff who haven't got access to Astute, which is the online portal that all staff members are asked to complete when they do safeguarding training. And then we also offer that training to councillors as well. But the councillor training is a lot more direct. It's more chance for you to ask questions, um, talk about any comments, queries, scenario situations that you've come across. So it just gives you a bit more of a personal touch, I would say, towards the training that you receive because you have more chance to answer questions rather than when you're on an online system sometimes. It can be a little bit frustrating if you want to find out a little bit more about what goes on in regards to safeguarding. So that continues. Um, safeguarding children at um, adult at risk policy and procedures, so that gets updated annually. So the next update for that will be uh, March next year. So we'll have an update in regards to the next meeting when we come forward. Just some of the other bits and pieces that we've been doing around safeguarding. So I attended the tenant consultation group meeting, first time I've attended, and it was a great opportunity for our tenants to ask questions about what we do around safeguarding, how we report safeguarding, um, support within the local community, but also in the wider community and referral networks. So it was a great opportunity, obviously, to make them aware of what services are um, available locally, as well as our role and responsibilities as a borough council. We're still active members of the Children and Adult Safeguarding Boards. Um, so there was an event that took place at the beginning of the month around domestic abuse. So domestic abuse is still one of our major priority areas and we've done lots and lots of work around the needs assessment around domestic abuse. Um, there is some work taking place in regards to our accreditation with DAHA, which is the Domestic Housing Alliance Group that we're working in progress with and we've done some work with New Era which is the Commission Service for Domestic Abuse Services to look at staff training more about risk assessments and the changes with the dial and dash forms the new DAHA forms that are coming in around um, stalking and harassment so it's important that staff are aware of those processes and how that will feed into the multi-agency risk assessment conferences as well so we're in the process of putting that in place. I have also um, put some links on there because New Era do offer some free online training. There's lots and lots of training that's run throughout the year. So if anybody feels you know it would be relevant for you to take part in that training or you've got an interest, then you've got the links on there as well um, that you can use at any point. Community safety. So um, Tamworth Borough Council supported the um, Children's Services Networking event that took place in September. And it was a really great event because it gave us an opportunity to find out about what was going on locally in Tamworth, especially for children and young people and the services. Um, very proud to say that Tamworth is um, fully staffed when it comes to children's social care. So we, we are doing really, really well when it comes to referrals that are going in for children and young people. We've got great working relationships. And I think for me, one of my biggest achievements is the fact that I've actually got um, the actual district lead for Tamworth Children's Services to be part of the Tamworth Fund Mobility Partnership meeting. So that's, that's great because they actually get to see some of the cases that we're discussing and they can help and signpost us and help with our escalation as well. So it's always good to have a contact person, but I think when you physically meet somebody and you have those conversations, it you know you build those partnerships and it does make um, great successes to achieving better outcomes for children and families that we work with as well. 
contextual safeguarding that still continues the multi-agency um panels that we attend and we just feed in and share information it mainly links into concerns around any antisocial behavior or young people that we know may be involved in antisocial behavior that could potentially lead into forms of exploitation or trafficking and we work very closely with the county council around any concerns and worries that we have regarding multi-agency um support and then the Tamworth and Reef Partnership, all I can say is just going from strength to strength. Uh, referrals are increasing with that, and I think, again, that's not a negative. I think that's a positive because <laughs> people are coming forward, they're referring in. We're getting lots of referrals now from mental health and children's services and not just our own housing staff. So it's getting out there. People are aware of it. They know that they can come to us and support us. And the feedback we've had has been absolutely excellent, especially from our mental health colleagues, the fact that we're working in partnership and supporting them and sharing that information about concerns and worries. And again, it's just a little bit of a breakdown really um, in regards to the cases that we've had so far. Um, majority, as you can see, the highest are around housing concerns. So that can be anything about the state of a property, about hoarding, it can be around um, neglect within the property, it can be around finances. So it covers quite a large area, but it just gives you a bit of an overview of some of the things that have been discussed when we talk about um, our, when we're going to partnership meeting. The Antisocial Behaviour Coordination Group is a weekly meeting, so again, um, any agency can attend the ASB meeting that we call it on a Wednesday. Again, it's all done virtually through Teams, and it's an opportunity just to share any hot spots, any concerns, any worries about things that are going on in the locality of Tamworth, and we can share it with our police representatives as well as other agencies, so we're working in partnership. And most importantly, we highlight any campaigns and events that we're doing. So one of the things that is coming out in November is um, Antisocial Behaviour Week on the 18th of November. So that's going to be a week of activity where lots and lots of partnerships are coming together. Police, um, Harmony are going to be two of the main uh, providers that are going to support the work that we do in the council around targeting antisocial behaviour and hotspot areas as well. And that's basically it. Thank you. Has anybody got any questions? Anything they'd like to ask? Excellent report, thank you. Um, any any questions, colleagues? Councillor Wells. <coughs> thank you very much. Um, I, I read all of this, and it's obviously there's a huge effort going on. And, and, and thank you for your thank you for your efforts in that. Um, I always question in my own mind, you know, what can we are we truly effective? Can we do more? So I've got a lot of things. If you don't mind, if I just put them in no particular order. I seem to remember reading somewhere that everybody is trained, quite quite rightly so, um, who have contact with the um, the general public to recognise signs of uh, abuse, and that's entirely correct. And there was a list of people on there, and I just wondered if we were missing an important group. And I know I keep saying this on various other things, so please bear with me. Are the waste dispi waste collective? They are. Brilliant. Yeah, so I, I do face-to-face -face training. I go out to the depot and I work with HR and they are trained every three years in safeguarding. Okay. They also have the opportunity for those who can access it to go on the Institute's training modules as well. But again, I like to do face-to-face -face with the waste management because they are the eyes and ears. They, they're out exactly. there, they're seeing things like in our parks mm -hmm. um, when they're going out on the um, streets. And we've had quite a lot of referrals around messy gardens, things that they've seen that have been a concern or where they know children are prevalent within that household. So it's a great opportunity just to say to them, you know, it doesn't matter how small you think it is, it's really important that you just share that information with us because it builds a bigger picture, potentially, of what's already going on. And we've got those links there as well. No, that's brilliant because I, I know on my ward, uh, walking around it, I, I, I sort of, somebody raised it to me and said they were a little bit worried about their neighbour or something like that. And, and when I actually found this house, it was so overgrown, it, it was difficult to see it was a house, you know. Uh, so, it, it, and obviously I understand that as an adult, he may not be at risk. It's his lifestyle, it's his opportunity. He can live how he or she wishes to as long as you know they, they 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 are not at risk if you like um and i think we did deal with that which is through through the means i reported that and that was dealt with adequately so but it just seemed to me that as you quite rightly have identified which is great that the the eyes and ears are are effectively we touch everybody with a bin effectively you know i think there's a great opportunity there second observation i've got is that you mentioned a wednesday meeting 
in terms of antisocial behaviour. I know uh, I probably say all of us, all counsellors have instances of antisocial behaviour reported to them and are obviously looking to deal with those as efficiently as possible. I myself have tried reaching out to the PCSO and trying to find time to sit down with PCSO in my area. Would it be possible or could we potentially drop into this Wednesday meeting? Is it even appropriate for us to think? So we have the Community that? Safety Inbox. Everything goes into the Community Safety Inbox that is overseen by the Community Safety Partnership team. So that's um, my line manager, Lisa Hall, okay. who's the um, Homes and Communities Manager. Then we've got um, Dave Jones, which is the Environmental Crime Officer, who right. also feeds in to okay. into the ASB. So anything that comes into that inbox is shared um, through them to have those conversations. So okay. it doesn't necessarily mean that councillors have to attend that meeting. Okay. It's just making sure that we are aware of the issues so we can have those conversations with the appropriate PCSOs and the police for that particular area. And if we have got concerns that there is an area where anti-social behaviour is quite prevalent, then we'll put them on the hotspot list where the patrol car will go out and identify. So we had a few concerns during the summer holidays around um, the libraries where young people were congregating around the libraries and climbing on the roofs and obviously that was a health and safety risk as well as potential antisocial behaviour. So again that was put on the hotspot list for uh, patrol officers to go out and monitor the situation and speak to the young people. We also engaged with our Snatcher County County um, lead around youth offending and she did some work with the young people around there to see you know, what was going on in the local area, what things were missing, what activities were needed support those young people around that so all that information is shared within that group that's great so we need to connect you yeah to that. so you, thank you you just need to send it through to that and then we'll pick that up and address that on your behalf and if there's anything individual then you can always um, email myself or lisa or dave with any information that you've got and we can make sure that hasn't been missed and that's been picked Brilliant. up thank you sorry thank you well uh, two things jackie i commend you on your report and yes. taking us through it as usual you're yeah, spot on um, on a second matter, uh, Andy, when you were talking about uh, attending the meeting, what we do on Stonydale, there's a Stonydale partnership meeting oh, cool. where the PCSO for the area is invited in, right. and also residents, and so also some of the community volunteers, and we sit down and we go through any particular issues. It's actually worked quite well. Okay. Um, so if anything pops up, John will take it away. Um, and usually what I do is I send a summary out uh, to Joe Sands right. and also to John Horton's uh, reporting officer. So it's watchable if both sides get an account and it gets picked up in the meetings. Okay. Uh, it's actually worked quite well. Uh, and we've actually moved on to community projects now. Okay. So I've got the local police involved in that as well. Thanks very much. I should pick up from that room. No, can I can I bring Councillor Bailey in? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the report. Um, I've got two questions. The first one, hopefully, is relatively straightforward. So, you said about the referrals. The referrals have increased because of training. Is that because of is the training improved, or is it just that the training has been offered to a wider audience? I think it's like anything. It's it's. If you have training, you for that first sort of few weeks, it stays fresh in your mind and you think about it. And then obviously the day job comes in a little bit, doesn't it, really? And then you forget about things. Then you think, oh, what, was it really that important? Should I have mentioned it? So I think with anything, when you, when you raise something or if you bring something, whether it's training, whether it's a briefing, whether it's an update, for that sort of first few weeks, people are, are, are straight on it in regards to it, making sure... So one of the things um, that we're thinking about doing, and again, it's a discussion that we're going to have, is um, like what the Safeguarding Children's Partnership do, they send out questionnaires every three to six months and say, as a result of this training, what have you benefited from? And it's a way of us just to capture staff, just to make sure that it still is on, on the radar. So that's a piece of work that we're looking at, potentially looking at working with HR to capture those staff members, to ask those questions, just to make sure it is on everybody's radar. In regards to that, and again, um, all the training that comes through from the Safeguarding Partnership, it all gets um, forwarded to all the managers. So it doesn't have to necessarily just be Safeguarding Pacific. It could be um, around recognition of neglect. It could be around domestic abuse. It could be around drug and alcohol abuse. It could be around mental health concerns. It could be learning from child practice safeguarding use. 
but the um, the annual um, training that goes out by the partnership is sent to all the managers and they disseminate it down to their staff to make sure their staff are aware. So it might be that staff member will come to us and say, oh, can I book on X training? Because I think this will be really useful for my role as a result of that as well. And again, that will highlight it. So it, it's just those constant reminders just to remember to remind staff in regards to that. So just on the training, so is that offered to, is it staff or... You know, like in Tamworth, there's contractors, they've got them in Birmingham, you know, engineers. Yeah, so it's all, all our staff. Yeah. Um, I have um, quarterly updates with our contractors and um, managers in regards to that. So they, they do their own in-house training as well, and they will send us a copy of their training so we can oversee it to make sure it meets our required standards of what we expect them to do. And then again, any updates that we're aware of that have come from Staffordshire, then I will liaise with those managers and send that updated information to make sure that the contact telephone numbers are, are correct, that they've got on there, they know the systems that are in place, by having those conversations with the correct agencies. So again, just a follow up, sorry. So if if somebody wants to make a referral, is it anonymous or, because I can imagine for some people, they are concerned about doing, you know, about reporting something because of the kickback from somewhere else we have a duty of care yeah. and it clearly states in all our policies and procedures we have a duty of care we have a duty of welfare to our residents to our tenants um if we see something we say something unfortunately that's the nature of the job you know we have to report we have to report something if we see something if you are a member of the public yes and we have referrals that come in through customer services that's when it can be quite difficult because we can't always go back to that person who's made that referral because it could be a false email address that they gave us mm. or a, a false name in regards to that. So we will still forward that information yeah. over, but the difficulty that we have and what we're always told in any training that we do, whether it's children or adult safeguarding, mm. the information needs to come first hand because when that referral is going in, they will be asked questions that predominantly I might not be able to answer because I wasn't physically there. And they will ask questions about well, what was the state of the property like? What was the state of the person like? How did they present themselves? What did you notice? And when it's second or third hand information, sometimes you miss vital bits of information, so it's really difficult. I mean, some contractors will pass it on to managers, and that's what we say. We say to our, our, um, our operatives, our waste management, I don't expect you to go on the phone. I don't expect you to ring up um, children's services or adult services. That's, your, that's the role of your manager. That's what your manager should be doing. That's part of what your supervision is about, to have those conversations and to make sure that your manager's aware. It's then your manager's responsibility to make those referrals in it. And if managers are struggling, that's where myself and the likes of Joe and Lisa will come in to support those managers in making those referrals. Okay, so somebody could, a contractor could report that to the manager, but be assured that their name will be protected. Because I think that's where maybe, if it's me, I'd be quite happy to put my name forward. But I can imagine some people... I think the issue contractor you've got with that as well, people know... Yeah. You know, when when yeah. referral comes in, we're not we're not gonna we're not gonna lie to people. We're not gonna say. So the majority of the time, when when somebody goes out to do an investigation, the person who's being investigated will say, "Oh, it's school that's reported me. Oh, it's welfare that's reported me. Yeah. Oh, it's the council that's reported me. It's the house matter that's reported me." Yeah. It's about working in partnership. Yeah. At the end of the day, and again, it, it's quite clear through training that we say, you know, if you're going into somebody's property, you are the eyes and ears, and you know you've got to be upfront and honest, and you know. You've got to address it with them and yeah, say, you know, okay. I've seen something and, it, and it's really concerned me. And as part of my job role, I have duty of care and I, ha I have to report this on to that person. I think the worst thing you can do is go behind somebody's back and not tell them. And that's where yeah. sometimes the anxiety and the frustration builds up as a result of that. And again, I understand what you're saying. It's, it's not about putting somebody at risk. So when, that, when a contractor did make a referral about a state of property, and it was a, a really poor state of a property, and the things he saw were just unbelievable, mm. He was, he was worried, as I said, about the backlash, but it's about going back in partnership with our housing officers and saying, right, we're going to go out and do a visit with the social worker, with the social worker kids, because the idea is we want to work with the family. We don't yeah. want them to think that we're ganging up against yes. them yeah. and behind their back. So we're very, very honest yeah. with them, and we will say to them, you know, we have a duty, and if yeah. we see something, we have to report it, mm. especially with one of our tenants in one of our properties. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I agree. I think we've all got a duty of care to make sure people are okay. Councillor Wells, did you want to uh, to come back? And I'll come to you after. Thanks. It was just just one thing I, because I don't know. I'm just going to ask. Um, uh, in terms of um, 
safeguarding particularly um, children. Um, it, it seems to me from my walking around experience, certainly in the summertime, that the, I'm, I'm, I'm picking up the impression, and again, that there's a fair degree of county lines drugs going on around in Tamworth. Now clearly those people are children and they are being exploited. And I just wondered what your thoughts were, whether we need to do more, whether we can do more or, 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 or what. But, you know, clearly I've seen incidences of, of, of people coming up on the train from Birmingham with that intent, but quite clearly uh, dispersing themselves into parks and so on. I've actually seen these things going on, particularly where I live. So uh, I, I'm guessing it's going on in other places as well around town. That was, I just wonder what you thought. The problem with county lines and exploitation is it's very fluid. And once the person knows they're being tracked and monitored, they will move from place to place. So county lines happens everywhere. I mean, we've had cases where it's happened in Alton Towers, Drayton Manor Park, you know, where young people have been met by adults giving drugs, paraphernalia, etc. So it happens absolutely everywhere. And it's around education. So education is key to educate our young people of the risks associated around county lines. So I always say it doesn't matter how much you educate a young person if you're not educating parents about what young people are accessing, what they're doing, what they're you know, part of as well. So loads and loads of work does go on with our schools, with our communities around obviously supporting young people, uh, working with young people about the risks. Uh, Staffordshire County Council have commissioned a service called Catch 22 that work with um, children who have been highlighted as risks on um, county line activity or exploitation. So part of the MACE panel looks at a risk factor matrix where any professional can complete a risk factor matrix um, in regards to whether they think somebody's a low level, a high or a medium risk. That conversation goes to panel and then a decision is made about what's in the best interest for that child, that family and to work with that. The cases that I tend to see aren't predominantly Tamworth cases. A lot of them are Birmingham children because we have a lot of children that are placed by Birmingham Children's Services into Tamworth that make links with Tamworth children. So we, we've got a huge issue with Birmingham and County know about this, we know about it. Um, it's, it is on the radar and it's, it's a, a huge piece of work that Staffordshire County Council are doing with Children's Services in Birmingham to get better connections and better feed through in regards to it. So I would say, looking at the statistics from what I see, I don't think we have a massive issue, particularly with county lines. We do have an issue with exploitation, but that is online exploitation that we tend to see because a lot of our young people don't physically meet their perpetrators. A lot of it happens through social media, through things such as TikTok, Snapchat, those sorts of things where they may be posing information or sharing images of themselves as a result of it so again it's around that education it's around that key and supporting our young people about you know what to do if they're in that situation so i know schools invest a lot of resources into exploitation and our cse coordinators go into our schools and work very closely around the risks associated around exploitation county line activity as well so there's lots and lots of things that go on but it's all behind the scenes. We don't always know about it. And it's really difficult because I'm not frontline. I don't work frontline. I work behind the scenes, but I feed into a lot of the work um, that the frontline stuff um, takes place and privy to. And obviously we feed into that and we support that as well. But because I don't work directly with children and young people, I rely on, on my colleagues at County to tell me what's going on locally and about what we can do to help and support them. And obviously the police play a massive part in that as well and the work that the police do and the PCSOs supporting young people and the county council around that as well so i'm not really answering the question as such but it, i'm trying to give you a bit of an over i'm trying to give you an overview of the fact that it is monitored it's not just something that we brush under the carpet and think oh it's not our issue it's a it's a county council issue because we are aware of it as well and it is around that education and hopefully by doing these events like the antisocial behavior week on the 18th of november we can link into other types of antisocial behavior and young people and adults and communities can come forward and tell us what's going on and what we need to concentrate on and look at any funding that we've got. Is there ways that we can fund and support those groups to help young people, establish young people around those concerns and worries as well? Councillor Turner. Yeah, thank you, Chair. <coughs> yeah, I'd like to uh, concur with my colleagues. Uh, great report, well done, keep up the good work. A couple of things that um, come to mind. Uh, you mentioned the hotspot list. 
is it possible that we can look at distributing that to the councillors, particularly the newer councillors that's come on board? I wouldn't have access to that personally because all I do is I, I um, support the admin of the actual group for that. So that would be a question that would have to go back to the likes of Joanne Sands and the Chief of Police in regards to that information. So um, I, can't, I can't answer that for you, but I'm sure if you send them an email and, and request of that, they would let you know. Thanks. Can I, can I do that through the chair? Thank you. A uh, couple of things. Um, obviously, you're talking, and um, these figures are really good, and obviously you do a lot of good work and, and, and keep it where it is. Do you think that the training budget is fit for purpose now and for the longer future plans? Also, your current team, is that big enough for where we're going forward? And if you had a, a, a shopping list of five, what five items would you put on that? Thank you. When you talk about team, I'm one person, I'm me. Yeah. So I, I, I am me, basically. Um, yes, I work in a community safety partnership. We all have different titles within that partnership, but um, I have my assistant director that I go to. I'm obviously my line manager, but when it comes to literally the safeguard, and it is me, I, I am that one person. When it comes to training, uh, I wouldn't say overloaded. It, it, it can get busy. You can guarantee if you want to go home on a Friday afternoon at three o'clock, it will never happen because you'll always get referral that comes in at half past three on a Friday, and it can take you up till five, six o'clock to sort it out in regards to it, but that's not every Friday. Like I said, yesterday um, was an extremely busy day, um, just an influx of, of referrals that came in, but that's not that's not every day, to say the least, in regards to that. Um, Training-wise, we have got a training budget. We've actually reduced the training budget because we're not using it. We don't use the training budget, and I think the reason we don't use the training budget is because we have the astute training, which obviously we offer out to staff, um, and I'm a trainer, I'm a trainer, so I deliver training. So that saves the council a lot of money in the fact that I, I will do the face-to-face -face so we're not literally having to pay for somebody to come in to deliver that training because I do all our in-house training, I do our councillor training. Um, we also offer training to our voluntary and community sectors as well in regards to that. So, you know, um, and it's about establishing that, those links and those partnerships where I think it's really important because we feed into them as well. Um, it's... You're, you're feeding that through and leading it, then obviously you need to keep abreast of the latest and the greatest and have one eye on where we need five years from now. Um, and that's that's where, where I'm looking at, yeah, the so strategy. I, like I said, um, I, I attend all the safeguarding partnership meetings, so um, they have lots of like briefings, updates, lunch and learn events that we can go to. Um, and it, what's really good is a lot of it is virtual, so it takes the travel out of that as well so that obviously saves time and resources in regards to it it's just it's reading up it's being aware reading up being aware of the legislation feeding into things um sometimes yes i wish we did have a bottomless endless pit of money because there's so many things that you can do with safeguarding but obviously resources are tight a lot of the the big national conferences are always london way so you're talking four or five hundred pounds by the time you've booked on a conference paid for your travel to get there well, the thing is, I do, uh, to me, I, I have to look at what benefit am I going to get from that. That I, you know, I, I want local. I need local. I don't need national, because I need to know what's going on locally for us in Staffordshire. As regards to that, if I feel that there is something relevant that I would benefit from, then I'm sure the council would say to me, yes, you, you could go on that. In regards to that, but we've had, um, I mean, our training budget is two and a half thousand pounds. I mean, in that two and a half thousand pounds, we've spent probably 500 of it in a year because there the just isn't the need there because, like I said, I, I deliver the training, I attend the free events that I go to. Um, a lot of the stuff that we put on for staff is all free as well. Um, so we, we're very lucky in that respect that we can do that. So it seems silly having a, a budget that we don't need at this particular time at the moment, but there's not to say that I don't think if... if if the opportunity presents itself and I need to do something, that I would be refused the opportunity to do that if it helps and supports the work that we do. I, I you know, my, my, my plan or the reasoning behind it is that we need to future proof all our departments and you're great where you are now and you're comfortable with that. We don't know where the trend is going. 
I guess it's going to get worse, but that's just a guess. And therefore, you need more people, more training and more awareness, maybe. But you're saying no, but is that a closed mind or an open mind? No, because, like I said, I, I deliver training. That's, that's what I do, as well as the, the job that I do. And it's about making sure that I'm, I'm clued up. Like I said, I'm very lucky. We've got a very supportive team, and I know I've got a manager and I've got a, a head of service, assistant director that I can go to. And if I feel that something's not right, I, I can speak up when I, you know, in a safe environment to do that. And I think because safeguarding is so important and everybody knows their responsibilities to it, it is supportive by the work that we do in regards to that. But, you know, it's silly. If people aren't going to use that pot of money to put that money back into the council for other resources that we can use, you know, but still have a budget there. I'm not saying get rid of the whole training budget. I'm saying we still need to have, obviously, money there just in case. But the likelihood of, act, of actually spending that £2,500 every year, it will never happen because, like I said, a lot of the training that we, we get is free. It's in-house training that I deliver. Um, you know, there's so many um, links on there. You probably, I mean, the board only charges £50 for training. It, in the scheme of things, that's, that's really reasonable, what we're paying. With it, so we're not going to use the two and a half thousand pound training budget at that point. So it makes sense to, to put those resources back into other council services. Um, you mentioned the uh, the lead time for ret referrals in the report. Is it going up or down? The the lead time for the referrals, both for the well, I, I wrote it lead time, but it's um, the amount of referrals you've got that's come into the department and how long it is before you deal with those cases so the, the referrals come in on the online form so on the on the staff info zone you've got the safeguarding tab you go in and you click whether it's a child or an adult form that form's done in timely so as soon as that member of staff completes that form that form automatically generates and goes into the safeguarding inbox as a result of it and on the end of the form it says what action has been taken and if you haven't taken any action why have you not taken any action so pretty much that form will come, it pings into my inbox anyway, as well as the safeguarding inbox. So if I'm not here, because I'm on leave, or um, I'm not in the office because of training or other commitments, then there's always somebody that can pick that email up and deal with it and ask those questions. So those those referrals, unless they come in late Friday evening, or if something's coming through um, the telephone, then they will be picked up pretty much straight away. It's acted on straight away. That member of staff is contacted and they're asked what they've done and if they haven't done anything why haven't they done anything as a result of it and then that will be for me then to chase up they're told yeah they have to be it has to be dealt with within 24 hours 24 hours it has to be dealt with councillor doyle thank you chair uh, jackie has the process changed much since signed it as a portfolio holder I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> okay, going back to something that Councillor Turner said, it's basically you don't understand what's happening. The safeguarding team at Tamworth Borough Council collect the information and then send it on to the next parties, whether that be police or Staffordshire, yeah? Mm -hmm. this, the, the information that comes into me will tell me what, what action's been taken yeah. as a result of it. So I will look through the information. I populate a form at the side of it to say what were the outcomes as a result of it. Did it go to police? Did it go to housing? Did it go well, to You don't referral? actually act on it. It gets passed on to the next level up yeah. for them to act but on the it. Staff, the member of staff who's made that referral has that responsibility, as we talked about, because they are first-hand. They're the ones who are seeing it. They're the ones who've got the concern. And if that member of staff hasn't picked that up, then I will go back to that member of staff and say, as you are the person who completed the form, it is your responsibility to ring it back through to social care, to mental health, to children's yeah, services. But it goes off to a different organisation yeah. for them to actually deal with the issue. It's not dealt with by Tamworth Borough Council. Okay, hold on a sec, let me finish. Uh, the next bit is, is it's primarily as councillors, our job is to collect information and feed it back, but not to act upon it and not to get involved. Uh, I've been doing this a while and uh, both personal and as a councillor, I've had uh, some interesting experiences. Um, so always pass the information on, but don't actually get involved. We're not Batman. Uh, and your own personal safety shouldn't be put at risk. 
that's basically what I wanted to say. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're not we're saying don't put yourself at an unnecessary risk, but you have a responsibility to call it in as a result of it. We're not asking you to be investigators. That's not your job to do that. It's not for you to investigate. It's not for you to ask questions in regards to that. It's just basically what you've been told, what you're dealing with, you report it. That decision then rests with social care, what action they're going to take as a result of it. If they decide that they're not going to take any action, which does happen, the staff do get frustrated and they'll say, well, social care aren't taking it. Well, what other things have you looked at? And this is one of the things that I've put together today in an email because a lot of the adult protection stuff is being battered back because they're saying it doesn't hit the threshold for adult protection. That's not to say we can't have a social care assessment. That's not to say that we can't look at other avenues of support that's available to them. So again, it's about working with those staff members and saying, have you thought about social care? Have you thought about a mental health assessment? Have you thought if that person's in crisis, have you made a crisis referral? rather than going through to adult protection. So there's different avenues that we can look at and signpost. And then most importantly, we have got the vulnerability partnership meeting. So if it doesn't hit the threshold for safeguarding, that's not to say we can't have a professional's meeting, we can't have a conversation at TVP about what we can do to move it forward. And like I said earlier on, the good thing about the TVP is you have got those people around the table anyway who can advise and support and say, have you thought about this? So it's not necessarily always coming from myself because I've got my colleagues of support from mental health, from social care, from children's services saying, actually, we could do this. We could try that as an option as well. So I always say to them, if it doesn't hit the threshold, send it to TVP. At least that way it's recorded, it's monitored, we've audited it, we've got a, a plan, we've got an action in place. Just coming back on that, um, I've seen it in action where they'll bring in, if you've got a family in crisis, um, say the mother's ill, father's absent, or um, the father's got mental health issues or so, they'll bring people in to try and support the kids and the parents and try and get them back on track. There's an awful lot of effort into trying to not so much extract the kids from the situation, but improve that situation so that they function more as an average family. Yeah. Uh, going back to the number of incidences, um, unfortunately, um, we tend to get uh, improvements in the system when something bad happens. Mm -hmm. And if you've done the training, you'll see various in instances where that's happened. And I mean, it's watchable. You can go all the way back to the 50s and 60s. My dad used to tell me about the Christian brothers and what they were like. Um, but as time has moved on, and especially in the last 10 or 20 years, there's a lot more focus on this, and there's a lot more training behind it. So uh, there's less chance of it being hidden, and um, it still exists, unfortunately. But overall, it's in decline because more people are aware of it and less prepared to put up with it. And a lot of these behaviours are inherited. Mm. Uh, mm. The dad's violent, so the son becomes violent, and he passes that on to his kids. But now there's more intervention, and hopefully it may be something that we are eventually eradicate. It'd be a nice thing to see, uh, but I don't think we're quite there yet. That's me finished. I think we're quite definitely not there yet, but um, things are getting better, and they have been for a while. Councillor Claymore. David Smith from Jaffe. What happens if the referral comes in at the weekend? So, again, if a referral comes in at the weekend, that member of staff will still contact the emergency duty team. So there's always an emergency duty team number that they can go to and have that conversation. Um, obviously, they're on um, very limited staff because it's on it's on on-call service uh, predominantly most of the time in regards to that. If it's a crisis, then obviously we say to them crisis. So we have got a handbook at the council with all the numbers for crisis situations that staff are trained on in regards to what they need to do. But the first thing we do is obviously pick that one Monday morning to make sure it's been dealt with. So there have been cases, you know, that have happened over the weekend. We've been in a situation. And like I said, we've, we've got very experienced staff. We're very lucky that our staff are very experienced um, that take the calls, that deal with it, and they know what to do. And then obviously we'll, we'll pick that up and follow that up with that staff member who's made that referral on the Monday to make sure they've been supported and they've got everything in place that they need. Right. Any other questions? 
The recommendation is that the committee review the report and raise any questions. I think we've done that quite thoroughly so far. There is a change to the recommendation needed because the portfolio holder should be Councillor Lewis Smith, isn't it? We think so. Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah there was there was on there on was a <laughs> confusion. Um, I rightly or wrongly, and apologise. I automatically assume that safeguarding would come under community safety and um, antisocial behaviour because the aspects around vulnerability. And then um, Leanne said to me, actually, it comes under people and well-being. So it, there's a bit of a crossover in regards to it because until it doesn't clearly state until obviously you sent me the, the paperwork, who covers what. So um, I, I assumed that it was Councillor Daniels that had that overall responsibility. And she was very kind and she endorsed the report um, in regards to that. And uh, Councillor Smith has been sent the report as well. But as, as of yet, I've had no comments. So I'm hoping with no comments, that's a good thing, that he hasn't anything that he's worried or concerned about in that respect. But obviously that is noted for next committee. It goes to the right portfolio holders. All I can do is apologise for that. Yeah, our understanding is that Councillor Smith is content with the content of this report. So with that amendment, um, are we happy to, and this is my favourite bit, note the report. <laughs> Everybody who's been on this committee before knows how much I love noting the report. <laughs> but the recommendation is there. Can I have somebody to move, please? Thank you, Councillor Doyle, to second. Councillor Wells, thank you very much. All those in favour? Thank you very much. Moving on then. Um, oh yes, Jackie, oh, you can go. Thank you. Nice to see you, Jackie. <laughs> you can you can put in my chair's notes, thank the officer, and let them go, <laughs> and I still didn't do it. <laughs> Are you, are you going to have to leave us? Yeah, okay, that's fine. So the forward plan um, is there as item nine. Are there any matters identified from the forward plan that the committee want to consider? There being none, I can tend to move on. Working group update. I don't think there is any update at the moment. And the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Work Plan, um, subject to the discussion we're about to have. Um, the next meeting is on the 26th of November, when, uh, when you will have an update on damp and mould from the Assistant Director, and that you are also planning to have a work planning <laughs> discussion after the meeting. I've just said that. I, well, I didn't yes. know you were going to say at the beginning. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so are there any matters on the scrutiny work plan which we're just about to have a discussion about? There being nothing, I'll move on and close the meeting at 6.53.